I am so excited to be here. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Natalia Winkleman. I graduated from CA in 2011, and I am now a film critic for The New York Times and a podcast producer of Culture Podcasts. And I am joined by a very impressive panel of women in entertainment, uh, one virtual and two in person, as you can see. Um, so why don't we start off by having the three of you introduce yourselves. Uh, perhaps you can say the year that you graduated from CA and where you currently live most of your time and um, the work that you do now. I guess I'll kick it off. Okay. Hi, I'm Danielle Lee. I'm class of 93, so celebrating my 30th uh, reunion this weekend. <laughs> Shout out to the class of 93. I live in Montclair, New Jersey. I'm a native New Yorker um, and uh, currently president of Artists and Fan Experiences at Warner Music Group. Um, I've just actually decided to leave that role and take a sabbatical um, and expand my uh, board portfolio. Um, but the work that I uh, have been doing for the past two years has been focused on helping artists, music artists, build their brand and their businesses beyond their music career. As many of you know, artists get an advance when they sign to a record label and they really don't make any more money until that advance is recouped. And so we help them build businesses through merchandising and content and licensing opportunities to help build up additional revenue streams so that they can live off of their art. Um, and we, we carry a roster of 300 artists. Um, and the, why I got into this work was really about um, helping artists build sustainable careers, right? I saw what, what Rihanna did with Fenty and the partnership she did with LVMH and was really inspired by that, not just because it was a great um, business venture for her, but it served a need in the community um, for women, women of color, women of different shapes and sizes who really weren't reflected in the beauty and fashion um, industries. So it's been an exciting ride and happy to tell more about my career as we go through the conversation. Oh, and, I, and I, yes, and I will say, I'm sure we'll talk about it more, and I will say that I'm going to need all three of you to be as braggy as possible <laughs> in these introductions, um, because if you won't, then I will butt in and brag for you. <laughs> and so, Danielle, I just want to highlight that this was a new initiative at Warner, and you were the first president of it, correct? That's absolutely correct. You know, I think the, um, the, the interesting thing, this idea of a music label really standing up a creative agency within its organization was really born out of this, this idea that it, it's a very siloed business where, you know, you're putting out records, you're promoting that record, and then you're moving on to the next track. And uh, these artists are, don't really have a team around them that's focused on you know, those in-between moments, right? Um, when there isn't new music to promote. And so the the businesses that we've, we, we're creating for them through e-commerce, through retail, through tour, are really helping them sustain that business and grow an evergreen business, even without new music. And, and actually, a lot of times, it's the old tracks, it's the catalog that really pops, the songs that you love, that that you recall, and having that memorabilia, having a piece of that um, and having it still be relevant is really what we gravitate towards. And then there's all of these new opportunities that um, artists aren't taking advantage of, gaming platforms, digital goods, virtual merchandise, um, NFTs and Web3 technology, and now with artificial intelligence. So it's about unlocking those new revenue streams for those artists and helping them show up in an authentic way in those platforms and also helping them grow their fan bases. Um, and for each artist, it, it's different, right? Um, these are bespoke business strategies that we're developing for them. And then once they approve them, we really move into execution. So it's been an exciting um, exciting and, and painful journey. Uh, really, you know, creatives are... Um, they're fickle and they are unpredictable and not always rational. And so when you're really trying to do things that make good business sense because there's a market opportunity, it takes some persuasion. Um, but it's been a fun ride. Yeah. And speaking of fickle creatives, we have two surrounding me. I'm just kidding. Uh, do you, Susanna, do you want to go next? Sure. Santa is sure. a, a Hi. very... 
Hi, I'm Susanna. Oh, thank Sorry. you. I'm I'm Susanna, and I'm a currently unemployed striking Writers Guild member. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm a writer and director and producer, um, and I like to think mentor of a, a younger generation of filmmakers, and particularly women and people of color who haven't had access to you know the the easier ride that that other people have had in the industry and now they have all these doors open to them. So I do a lot of mentoring for the Sundance lab. Um, and I have a habit of like finding people in that lab and trying to make it my, you know, um, side hustle to try to help them get their movies made. I've had limited success with that, but I'm really determined to keep doing it. Um, and then I travel a lot. I'm mostly based in Los Angeles, but as a director, I travel all over the world for various shoots, which is very exciting and I like to complain about not having a mailing address, but I secretly love it because I've always been really nomadic and I'm most comfortable living out of a suitcase. I know that's not the most functional thing, but that's true. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, I've had a I had a long road to becoming a working writer and director, starting with making short films when I was here at Concord Academy. Um, and uh, having really like oversized dreams for the level of talent I had at the time and access. Um, and then uh, had a lot of really demeaning day jobs in Los Angeles, which is a demeaning place to have day jobs. Um, and then eventually was able to start working professionally. And then um, I feel like I'm really rambling and saying, and then, and then, and then a lot. But uh, yeah, so I, I've made four films and, and a lot of television shows. I'm, I feel really committed to expanding the uh, scope of what people think that female filmmakers can do and also to not get pigeonholed in one particular genre or another, which is another thing that happens to filmmakers generally, but in particular women. Um, so I've done some comedy, I've done some drama, I recently worked on a period piece, I've done some writing for animation. Um, I'm, I'm just really looking to find important stories to tell and hopefully tell them in an entertaining way, even if there's some nutritional content within. So but broccoli tempura is what my friend likes to call it. So I like to make broccoli tempura with my work. So, yeah. And do you, do you want to highlight a few of those credits? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, no, uh, sure. I um, everyone has heard of a lot of them. So. Oh, uh, well, I um, let's see. For those of you who have kids, I was one of many writers on the animated Adams Family too. Adams Family, thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see, I, I wrote and directed a, a film called The Spy Who Dumped Me, which is a ridiculous big comedy about girls going to Europe um, and car chases and explosions and things like that. Uh, I was one of the writers on a, a comedy about um, nerdy intellectual high school girls called Booksmart. <laughs> Um, and most recently I, uh, I directed a series that's airing on Disney plus currently called a small light, which is about Meep Geese, the woman who housed the Frank family in Amsterdam with her husband. Uh, and that is a coming of age story about a 20 something newlywed couple, um, and sort of what was going on for her on the other side of the bookcase and the importance of allyship and what to do as a bystander and how we can, um, take action instead of not taking action. And um, that was a, but, but also she was kind of just a normal girl in her twenties having quarter life issues as she was also doing this huge high stakes thing. So the show is trying to show that, that she was kind of a normal complicated person with some anxiety and misgivings about like doing the heroic thing. So it's not just a story of a woman who has no um, regrets or missteps. She's just a person who's like, what did I get myself into? But I know this is the right thing, but I didn't know it'd be so hard. And um, just trying to personalize the the journey that she had and take it out of this historical document format that that period of history is often told in. Um, let's see. I wrote a I wrote a, a comedic novel about my family, which I hesitate to talk about because my brother will be a freshman here in the fall. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to get into it too much. He's in the book. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, I used all of my like teen angst, which I. Um, uh, seasoned and perfected here at Concord Academy to like form a comedy writing career and then directed from there. So that's my life. And just to highlight a few others, the, you were nominated for an Emmy for the Flight Attendant series, which was incredible, and um, and one that 
only a few people have seen is the movie version of Cat Person, which was a viral New Yorker story. Um, and this was, I, I was at Sundance. And so I know that I can attest to this. It was the buzziest film at Sundance. Everybody was trying to see it and talk about it. So that was also really exciting. <laughs> Um, and last but not least, I will throw to Rachel. Hi, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I was at the, I guess, right between and kind of with overlapping both of these amazing women um, sitting before you. I graduated from the class of 96. I was also a very nasty teenager uh, taking a photo with Cynthia Katz, taking a film with Chris Rowe channeling all that angst into outside visions for my future. Um, and I never stopped. I really, like, I, I went to NYU afterwards with photography, but always, I think, knew I wanted to get into cinematography, and ultimately sort of transitioned into cinematography, and now I'm pivoting also into directing. Um, I don't love public speaking, so bear with me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate that, I mean, you know, even though it's actually and quite some time since the yeah, it's been a really amazing journey. I've got to make some pretty incredible films that I'm really proud of. Um, as it's been hard for some of the highlights are Fruitvale Station, which was the launching pad for, for um, Brian Googler, Michael B. Jordan, uh, and we sort of went off together and, and went on to make a, a bigger film called Black Panther. Um, <laughs> a little known film. Uh, just a little known film called Black Panther. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I've mostly been in the drama space, so that's fundamentally where my heart is. Um, and I'm now pivoting to directing as well. And I just finished my first feature about a boxer from Flint, Michigan, named Carissa, it's a true story, named Carissa Shields. The film is called Flint Strong, and it'll be out. Hope, hope, I mean, I think it's, it's looking like it's probably going to be fall of next year, which is kind of crazy because of the whole MGM Amazon merger, the strike, and everything else. But I'm very proud of it and I'm excited for that new chapter of my life. So. Oh, yeah. um, and, and also, uh, Mudbound for which you received the first nomination for a woman cinematographer for the Academy Award, which is incredible. That's a huge achievement. And Mudbound is a beautiful movie on Netflix uh, that Rachel was the DP on. And that was the first time that a woman has been nominated for an Oscar in cinematography, which is just mind blowing that it took so long. Um, but I wanted to highlight that as well, Rachel. Please. She also did one more thing, which is she directed the pilot of a television show that was created by another Concord Academy alum. So that's not a small thing or an irrelevant thing for this panel. It's called Hightown. It's really good. It's on stars. Concord solidarity. <laughs> um, you, you've talked about this a little, but since we're here back at CA, if we could cast your minds back to being a teenager here, um, could you ever have envisioned that you are where you are today. I mean, was this a, the course that you took, was it driven by a kind of a singular ambition or aim or did serendipity play a role? I mean, these, I know that people can have roundabout routes to getting where they are. So I'm curious um, if you could talk about that a little. So many of the jobs that I've had um, didn't exist when I went to CA. So certainly could not have imagined uh, this career um, I've spent my career in a variety of innovation and marketing roles um, for both sort of Fortune 10 companies and then growth and growth stage and startup uh, companies. Um, and I think the singular thread that really connected those experiences was just a fascination with uh, new technologies that fundamentally shift consumer behavior. Um, and so what that looked like coming out of business school was uh, going to Showtime uh, as On Demand was launching for the very first time, right? And taking a marketing role where I literally had to teach uh, consumers the benefits and the value proposition around why you watch something on demand as opposed to linear. I know I sound like a dinosaur, but that actually like needed to be communicated, right? Um, and then I went over to AT&T uh, as they were sort of experimenting with launching a media business within their massive subscription business. 
and doing that in a very careful way not to cannibalize, uh, you know, there are billion, billions in um, subscription revenue. Um, so all of the advertising that you get on your phones, that, that, that didn't exist um, as, I, as I came into that role. Um, and then going over to Spotify to scale streaming audio around the world, we launched um, Spotify in 30 countries uh, during the time I was there and took the company public. So absolutely could not have imagined having these experiences as these, these things didn't exist when I was a student here. But I think um, part of what I learned here that made me succeed in these spaces was about how to harness your fear and um, take risks, um, how to make mistakes and, and fail and dust yourself off and pick yourself up and try again. Um, you know, I came to Concord at 14 years old um, from Harlem, New York City, had never been here before. Um, I was a, an a better chance scholar. Um, and this place was a world that was so foreign to me um, from my experience, my lived experience in Harlem. And when I think back to that that kid who actually some friends um, sent some picture, <laughs> pictures from the um, alumni of color um, reunion that happened a few weeks ago. Um, and I was just, and she said, hey, do you remember this girl? And I was like, yeah, I remember that mad girl. <laughs> like, I, I remember those experiences where you didn't quite feel like you fit in or you didn't re weren't really sure about how you were going to um, accomplish the task and all the work and and succeed and and achieve your dream and then set a new goal and a new dream and Concord really prepared me for those types of experiences in the workplace going into worlds that I wasn't a part of that into systems that really weren't set up for me to succeed and figuring it out um, I think the other thing that Concord gave me was you know, it was the first time I really exercised my voice. And I think the chapel was a beautiful opportunity to do that at such a tender age. And boy, have I been called on um, that, that confidence and that grit to stand up in front of audiences and um, boardrooms and executives and tell my truth in, uh, in an authentic way in a way that was constructive, in a way that was um, edifying for the organization um, and the culture, um, but at great risk and being vulnerable. Um, and those were, those were things that I kind of first tried to do here. And so a lot of the experiences I had here really have set me up to have the amazing career that I've had. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> was it a direct line to doing the thing we did? Okay. You're so good at, the, you're so well, good at public was, speaking. It, yeah. How much did, how much did serendipity play a role in your trajectory versus a direct course driven by a singular kind of aim or ambition? Um, I, I think I was pretty driven to be a filmmaker even before I got to CA as people that overlapped here with me might remember I was like huddled in the computer lab because there was a computer lab where we like dialed into the internet and took 45 minutes to get online. Um, but I would like be like hunched over writing screenplays um, that were terrible, but I was doing that when I was here. Um, I always wanted to do this and I really, I think I, I came to appreciate later that this was an environment in which that was really um, supported. and. Um, I talked to friends who went to other schools, in particular other boarding schools, and they did not have that experience. It was much more sort of like the conventional, athletic, preppy New England boarding school environment. And I, I remember getting here and feeling like there wasn't there there was there wasn't like a norm. There wasn't like a popular norm that was related to a normal high school. It was sort of everyone was themselves, and the school was so incredibly progressive for its time in ways that I come to appreciate now, like seeing so much of the the culture and the conversations people are having um, about identity and equality and all of that. Like we were 
talking about it in our 90s way then, you know, and, and I don't know. So I really appreciate that the school like was encouraging of that kind of expansive thinking and and just like motivation. Um, yeah, it, I mean, I was always motivated to to be a filmmaker, but it took a really long time to get there. And that road was paved with lots of failures and lots of circuitous odd jobs. Um, the most important thing was just to keep generating more writing and trying to work and you know, when I was um, 24, I had like a temp job at a um, home building company that was later accused of fraud and everyone got arrested and they're in, they're in jail. But in the <laughs> meantime, I was the secretary and I like ordered Kohler sink parts for my boss and I saved up all this money so I could make like a three minute short film, which Rachel filmed for me. Um, she and I had been roommates uh, right after I graduated from CA. Uh, our parents were friends. So we lived with four girls in a one bedroom apartment in Soho. Um, which what did that apartment look like? Uh, I I have memories of like sheets being used as partitions between the rooms. Um, I don't have a lot of other memories of it. I blacked it out, but I remembered <laughs> Rachel. Um, anyway, so yeah, just really like the the community building, just finding people to make stuff with, and just how it feels to make something when you're in high school or summer camp or you're a kid and you're not thinking about your career and what it all means or your brand or any of the things that people are obsessed with now. If you can just get back to the basics of like, let me hang out with people and talk about something that would be entertaining and then find a way to make it. Um, that every time I've sort of had to be innovative in that way, that really started here. Um, it's led to some interesting thing happening in my career, even at like a higher more professional level. Like every time I like didn't know what else to do, I just found some kernel of motivation to make something with someone, even if it was just a side secret thing we were doing. And it's not that different from when I'd get together with my friends here and like write screenplays about the teacher we had a crush on and how he was like secretly in love with us after grading our labs. We won't get into that. Um, but you know, I did all that then. And it's like, I still do my adult version of that <laughs> in my life and it leads to interesting things. So um, <laughs> yeah. So is the uh, teacher in the audience right now? No, <laughs> being pre being prepared, being prepared for things to like, being prepared for surprises is important too. Because as as Rachel can attest to, it's like you you're actually asking people to as you make things at a high, higher and higher level, you're you're responsible for you're essentially like a CEO of somebody's multi million dollar investment, and you don't own the product in a way like you can do your best job and feel so much ownership and you can really bleed on the page for it in every way. And then at the end of the day, they own it. They decide what the release plan is. They market it. You can only do so much and having to give everything to it, but then like emotionally divorce yourself from the outcome, reflecting anything about your self-esteem is really challenging. Um, and anyway, it's something that Rachel and I talk about um, in our, in our, regular friendship when we're not I'm um, talking to hundreds of people in a in our high school. <laughs> um Rachel, do you want to weigh in on that as well? The I uh the 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 roles that serendipity played versus ambition in in getting you where you are today. I mean I think it's a combination of both. I mean especially in the film industry it's sort of you need <clears throat> luck to get in the door and you need skill to stay there. Um but I think everything that that both you know, Susanna and Danielle said, like, I even just hearing about the chapel, I'm like, oh, that's where I learned to be vulnerable. That's where I learned to, like, I mean, clearly, like, I'm still not a master of public speaking, but, like, it takes everything for me to do it. And, like, the, the kernels of that, I'm sure, came out of CA, it just hadn't even occurred to me. Um, you know, and then the collaborative nature of what we do. Like, I, I think also to what Susanna speaking about, like, ultimately, the reason I chose song or photo is as great as photo was for me as a teenager in the dark room listening to brooding music, like I didn't want a lifetime of a solo career where I wasn't interacting with people on a regular basis, where I wasn't, you know, leading a charge at some point, following a charge at others. Um, but I, I really love that what we do, you know, for one thing, uh, actually this is a little bit of a, of a side note, but I think it, it speaks to what Sam was saying about there's, there's a level of uncertainty and unpredictability with, with at least our job. Like you never know when the phone's going to ring, who's going to be on the other end of it, and what country you're going to be in the next week. And like it takes a certain type of person to be okay with that. You know, it's it's very it's the opposite of a nine to five nine to five job with a steady paycheck. And I think going back to what you were saying about you know CA is the kind of school that that lets you believe you can have a job like that. that you don't have to be on this track where you go to college and then to med school and then to, you know, with the end goal of having regularity and predictability in your life. 
Um, so you have to be okay with uncertainty and live with a lot of it, but like the reward is, you know, exponential. Right. And I think another thing that allows you to feel comfortable pursuing any kind of job is also having uh, someone that you can see in that role that you think I could be that too. And so, to, you know, in light of that, I want to also highlight that this is a panel made up entirely of women, which I don't, not in a facile way, but this is, feels special because I feel like every day I'm reading in Variety or The Hollywood Reporter some depressing statistic about how underrepresented women are. Um, there are constantly stories about women being underestimated or disrespected in these industries and fields. Um, so I'm curious, you know, as women who are excelling, um, it, what obstacles do you see to women entering these fields or in these fields? And are there instances of you encountering obstacles because of your identity? Was that a rhetorical question? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> the struggle is real, I, I, period, end of story. And I think it takes a certain amount of resilience and determination to stay in it. Um, and I think what has helped me is to find purpose in my work. Um, it's not, at some point, it shifts from being about the money and security and stability to being about the impact that I'm able to make. And um, there were countless times throughout my ascent that I questioned, is it worth it? What am I sacrificing? How is this impacting my mental and emotional health? Um, and, you know, the injustices you experience in these spaces, um, it takes a lot of work to keep yourself whole. And so I think as, especially, you know, as you become a leader in these environments, there is a tax and a burden put on, on you to be that be that voice and and speak the truth and hold people accountable and have uncomfortable conversations um, and represent views that maybe aren't as popular or, or as well well understood um, and it becomes less about the marketing or the business growth and the balance of those things it it's it's um it's it's really daunting. Um, I will, but I've also had experiences where um, I've been encouraged to um, say more, um, be bold. I, I think about my time at AT and T, which couldn't be more of a a boys' club, right? Um, you know, headquartered in in Dallas, Texas. Um, hundred year old brand, and here I am, you know, new mom coming out of B school, you know, had was that showtime for two years and then spent the next seven at ATT um building their media business. Um and my ascent was was quite rapid. Um I was the only black VP in my in my division. Um and I looked around the the conference room and in our executive leadership team meeting, and I'm the youngest, I'm the only woman, I'm the only person of color, I'm the only mother, and I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, how did I get into this room? And you can't help but feel, um, question, am, am I worthy? Um, but I was also the most, you know, educated, um, with sort of in the traditional sense, um, with the most degrees. And, um, you know, I think it took a peer pulling me aside and saying, you need to stop being so quiet. We need, we want to, you're here because we want to know what you think. We want to hear your voice. And 
it wasn't until he gave me that permission, right? And and also I will say I am I'm more of an observer, right? Like I like to take things in and and be introspective and speak when I actually have something of value to say. And I was operating in a culture where it was just the loudest voice in the room was the smartest person in the room. And if you weren't talking, then you know, everyone's questioning, you know, what are you doing there or what are you thinking? Or, you know, they they start distrusting you, right? So um you also have to know what the rules of the road are. And um, I think that really helped me to um, kind of find my way. But I, I will say that the challenge for women now is, is um, I think it still remains that having that courage, having that courage to um, speak your truth, but also you're not there to maintain the status quo you are there to change the game for the next generation. And I think that ultimately became the, the mantle that I took up. If, if I'm going to be the only woman and the only black person in this room, I need to create, open the door for the next set of leaders to, to follow behind me and also make, make this a better place and a better experience for, for everyone. Um, and I'm not going to be able to do that if I'm, you know, mincing words or um, not not saying what, not being real, not being real. And, um, but that's exhausting. And, you know, and I think you have to do everything in your power to stay whole and keep yourself um, from, from feeling like you, you lost, lost the plot. Yeah. Takes a lot of energy. I mean, that's great. And and what you said about making it better for the next generation, I think is really important. Um, is, that, is that something that resonated with you, Susan? I know yeah. you said that mentorship was a big part of your yeah. mission as a filmmaker. Yeah, it is. Um, I think that, you know, the world has changed so much since um, just in the in the span of time that I've been working professionally, it's the sexism is um, it's like mutated in its forms. So it's not the same um, as it was. It's just crops up in other ways. And I think because there are, because there's been this um, because the optics of people trying to change it are so loud. That's a mixed metaphor, but you know, because people are like, we're changing it, we're solving it. Um, there are so many subtle ways that sexism is so rampant and just people's lens on things is so skewed. Uh, but it's not talked about because we solved the bigger, you know, um, so like just as an example, um, if you're a female director, if you're a female director trying to make specific aesthetic choices with something, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of control from the top down, like, if the if 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 this is a feminine if we want we want to check these boxes so make sure that you have um there's like mandates for the way that you do your job and you make decisions that are more about the the wanting them wanting to be on the right side of a conversation and less about empowering the actual filmmaker to make the movie in the way that she sees fit or he um so it's like that's where i notice it it's like i notice it when a studio is mandating that i have a female do a cover of a song by a man that i want to use in my movie and i'm like why and they're like well it's more feminist if we have a female sing the song i'm like it's feminist to let the female director pick the song right <laughs> um but anyway so there's a lot of that <laughs> uh so let there's me make my movie man you, you know what i mean so, yeah and it, and it and it comes from this place that's like it's I don't know, you can have a cynical take on why people are doing it, like they just don't want to get in trouble for not doing it, or you can believe they truly want, it's just there's a really, there's a really like ham-fisted way that people are trying to solve the problem of sexism that I find to be pretty ineffective and like it lacks nuance, like so much of conversations on Twitter and like, uh, you know, it's it's really hard to to say, yes, I have I have so many opportunities I'm so grateful for that I wouldn't have been able to have when I started out in Hollywood. Um, because there was so little, I would hear more overtly sexist things in rooms then. Like, this is really good. We'd make it if it was about boys, but it's about girls. So I think it's disgusting. Direct quote. Um, you know, or like that type of thing. Or, you know, you, you make niche movies because they're about women. If you want to have a career, you should write something about a man's experience. Or even you can't direct a movie about a man 
because you're a woman and men can direct movies about women, but women can only direct women's movie. You know, there's like, it, there's so many levels of that. Or even if there's a movie with a male protagonist, the directors that are on the lists are, are usually um, men, you know, and you have to really just kind of just blaze through that the way that Rachel's done. Um, but it's not someone's first thought, you know, so you have to kind of like constantly educate people and push, push on this need to kind of like put everyone in a, in a, in a box or just like the laziness of just looking out, out at the world through this lens of not questioning mm -hmm. that the perspective is, is one that is like a decades of entrenched centuries of entrenched sexism in that way. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's like noticing the subtle ways in which it still really crops up and always asking myself, like, what would a, would a man be in this position? And you never know, like you can never answer that question. Would they be talking to me like this? If I was a man, I don't know. I can never know. I don't want to overcorrect and like always assume it's about that. Um, but sometimes it is about that. So it's just constantly asking yourself that and and trying to, as Danielle said, like we're just raised differently as women and hopefully that's going to start to change with every generation. But we're not, we are raised to think about whether people like us or not in a way that men, we're, we're raised to think like, why me, not why not me, you know? Um, and we just have to kind of like try to, train ourselves not to think like that, but it is a challenge to do. Um, and there's also like a certain way that I have this joke with my other fem female filmmaker friends that like, we talk about the uniform, like there's this uniform that you wear when you want to just like get a job and it's kind of this like act like a man thing. I know that's it's so problematic to say that, but you know, we're like, oh yeah, you walk in like so confident, like you already have the job and it usually works. And that's a problem. You should be able to be like, I don't know, there's things I don't know, but I'm still going to do the best job but you have to kind of act like you know what you're doing. Like when you tell a studio you can direct a car chase and you don't know how to do that and you figure it out. Right. <laughs> and part of the problem is that is if a lot of the people in that room from the studio end have a, have a, have a vision in their mind of what a director looks like and it's a white man holding a, holding a bullhorn, you know, screaming at his underlings. So once that image changes, which hopefully it's continuing to do. Yeah, and I'll, and I also think that like, it's not, we're in the phase now where there's a lot of people that, it's not better to give a woman a job and then not let her do her job. It's not better to be like, a woman's directing, but we're backseat driving every single step of the way because we, because that's actually how we feel about directors or, I, I mean, that's not better for us. It doesn't set us up to do our best work, but that's where I feel, feel and see the sexism the most. So most of the times I help a younger filmmaker make something, like 90% of what I'm doing is just saying, Yes, you. Yes, you're ready for this. Yes, you. Or they'll call and say this person said I didn't know wasn't ready for this. I'm like you are. You know, it's just really just saying, like fuck that person. I know we're recording this, but you know what I'm saying. It's like it's like ninety percent of what I'm doing there is just cheerleading them and and amplifying them. Okay, I'm done. Right. No, that's great. <laughs> um, Rachel, have you had similar experiences? I, you, you, you also um, have worked in different modes. I mean, you've been in reality TV, you've been, uh, you've been behind the camera as a cinematographer and, and now as a director. Um, I'm curious about how in these different modes you've experienced obstacles um, to success because you are a woman. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's often comes down to money, right? Like I, I, for me, I'd shot something like 10 Sundance films before I was given the opportunity to shoot one studio movie where at the time I was watching, you know, these indie kids, male, male DPs get one good Sundance movie and they're off to the races doing bigger budget things. I think, you know, Ryan going to bat for me on Black Panther and getting, and getting behind me making that leap really opened the doors, not just for me, but for all the women that came after me, you know, Black Panther being the success it was with me behind the lens then did sort of help open the door for other women to get bigger movies. And then every movie, you know, every movie, my friend Autumn did the second Black Panther while I was doing my movie. And, and that was also a huge success and really beautiful. And that opens the door for another five, you know, cinematographers to shoot things with bigger budgets. And I, I do think it's changing. I, I, I like, I have to hope it's changing. Um, but I think, you know, there's a bit of the one step forward or three, you know, for every one step forward, a few steps back in the same way that the political shifts, you know, swing, swing wide. It's like there was this, you know, movement a few years ago where it was really, a lot of women been, being given a lot of chances, you know, and, and people of color and basically like, let's let everybody else in. And now there's a bit of a backlash and you just, you see these, you know, these titles, title shifts, I guess. Um, I have been very fortunate. I think because I come from camera, 
And there is this perception, like that's the thing that that studios tend to worry about with with women is like technically are they proficient? And it's such a, I mean, I, you know, this is an art form, and we're telling these stories that are all about building empathy. I feel like it's it's everything we're really equipped to do. But I think because I have this very basic technical knowledge, it's it's allowed me indoors that other women, you know, weren't given the same access to as, you know, easily, I guess. Um, and I guess, you know, the confidence is a big part too. I think you do uh, walk in with a certain amount of confidence that really helps assure people where, you know, I always say that like, you know, men sort of get the, like, if they scream, they're geniuses, if they are under, if they're, you know, quiet, they're understated, and women are sort of expected to toe this very narrow line where if, if, if a woman's quiet, she's indecisive, if a woman's loud, she's a, you know, a word I won't mention, but like, th that was always the way. And I think until we really broaden the spectrum to let everybody, I mean, this is sort of what Susanna's saying, like, everybody direct how they direct, you know, be who they are, be, be honest about what they, what they don't know, but what they feel equipped to learn. Like that's, that's the next move. But, you know, I, I do think, I think it's changing. I think it's exponential. I feel, and, you know, like, like these guys, like I, I try to mentor wherever I can. I have two small kids of my own now, which takes, you know, time, time away from the, I realized I was taking on like mentees every year from different places. And it's like, it's not like they go away the next year. The next thing you know, you have like, you know, 25 mentees over the, over the course of time, whatever. And now I have, you know, two small children who are constantly in need of attention. But, you know, I, I do think um, as long as we continue to champion the next generation and also lead by example, like I think that, that it will eventually change in a really positive way. This was such a quick panel. We're already, already almost finished, but I think we have time for one quick question from the audience. Right in the front here, yeah. Oh. Um, it's really more of a comment, but listening to you all is quite emotional. Um, and I feel, I don't want to speak for my entire generation, but as one of many in my class anyway, who chose to follow um, careers in the arts and who felt because of CA that we deserve to have careers in the arts. Um, it is incredibly life affirming to listen to you all and to feel, I didn't expect to get this out of this weekend, but to feel that we actually did something to push things forward for you, hopefully, and that you are able to accomplish so much more as a result, hopefully, and that you are also championing the the cause of pushing things forward for women in the arts. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a really lovely note to end on. Thank you. And thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we'll all be around in the lobby for additional questions and um, look out for new work these women on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you.